You know, so we've been walking through the book of Luke uh, for the last decade, and now we're finally into the last week of Jesus' life, which seems like it's taking six months um, for four or five days. And I, if you were here two weeks ago on Memorial Day when I spoke, again, um, there's a lot going on this last week, and I would still encourage you, if you have the chance, get the biggest coffee mug you have, iced tea, whatever your drink is, maybe in the morning, and read through this section maybe in one sitting if you can, right? If you can watch a 30-minute uh, sitcom, you can read a 35-minute chunk of scripture. Or if you're a slow reader like me, hence the big cup of coffee, it takes an hour long. It's a drama, all right? So um, with that, um, again, I would just encourage you, because there's a lot going on, and we're going to look at this one part today. Um, really is setting up mostly a lot for next week, um, but there's some significant things we're going to take a look at. But again, this is a week here where Jesus is intentionally loving on his disciples, um, kind of like the sports analogy, right? When you're in there and it's about, you know, half an hour before you're going to hit the field, you're, you're going over the most important things. You're reminding your players, you're reminding your team, your disciples, hey, remember this, remember this, remember this. This is going to happen. This is their strategy, what have you, what have you, right? And that's what Jesus is doing. Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll look at kind of the upper room kind of a scenario, and, and next week as well. And he is, he's, he's spending time with his disciples, teaching them, reminding them of, of what's about to take place and encouraging them, all right? So again, uh, one of my favorite um, chunks of scripture, I would just encourage us to, uh, to take a look at that. Uh, Luke 22, 1 through 13 is where we're going to look at today, um, and it's really kind of two different pieces here. Um, it starts out with this. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover, right? So Luke is now talking about these two festivals that were instituted way back when as the Israelites were going to be leaving um, Egypt, and they celebrated this. They were called to celebrate these two festivals every year as a reminder to the faithfulness of God. And so again, this is the season that these cel- these. Um, um, festivals are taking place, and so Luke is, is now recording that um, that's the background of what's going on, right? These two things were separate um, festivals. They kind of overlapped by a day, and then by the time of, of Jesus here, they kind of re- would refer to them either or as kind of the same festival. Instead of becoming two, it became kind of like one two-part series that they would celebrate. The Passover, of course, um, being the sparing of life, for Israel's firstborn. So if you remember your um, Israel uh, Jewish history, when they were still in Egypt, God was about to, to um, bring his people out of Egypt. And to this point, Pharaoh was saying, I don't think so. And God said, no, now you will, right? So he, so he had the Israelites um, sacrifice an unple- unblemished lamb and put the blood over the doorpost so that when the angel of death came over, when it passed over, their children, their firstborn would be spared. And this angel went throughout the whole land and killed every firstborn of person or animal. And there was huge, huge weeping all throughout Egypt. And Pharaoh finally said, yeah, you can leave now. And so that was the other piece of of the unleavened bread, right? They were prepared to leave in haste. And so um, in a way of just remembering the Exodus, which was the other part of that, they would have this bread that was ready to go that was made without yeast, without leaven, um, which they would take with them out to the desert. And so as a reminder, year in and year out, they would celebrate Passover, that God spared the life of their children and their, and their um, animals, and also that he set them free. And that, those are two key themes that run not only through Israel and Judaism, but really was a signpost that the people should have been seeing those two themes that Messiah was going to fulfill both of those, that he was going to lead the ultimate exodus, and he was actually going to be the ultimate lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. And we saw that back when he got baptized, that John even recognized that and said, look, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And they should have understood that because those two themes were just paramount to who they are. And so they shouldn't have been missing this. And, the, and some of the irony or just the awesomeness of God is God orchestrates what's taking place this week for Jesus to be crucified in the backdrop of this so as people know this is fulfillment, this isn't failure. And that's what's going on here. The, the people are trying to reject it and seeing this as, you know what, sound like a nice nationalistic plan, but 
I don't think so, and they're rejecting him for a host of reasons. Uh, but the reality is that this should have most had them attuned to, wow, this is God and the hand of God at work, and they missed it. So that's the, the backdrop of these things that are going on, that the crucifixion uh, ultimately would, would provide for redemption, um, whereas the enemy of God thought that was the final solution, that they could somehow thwart the redemptive plan of God. So verse 2, as the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, they feared, for they feared the people. Right? So some things going on here. The chief priests and scribes were seeking. This is continual. They had been trying for years to find a way. How do we get rid of this man? He's, he's in conflict with us. He doesn't agree with us. Or rather, we don't agree with him. And, he's, and this was going on for pretty much the whole three years of Jesus' public ministry. They were enemies from... Pretty much the the first time they examined him and what he was saying, they wrote him off. And they've been looking and looking and looking for a way to kill him ever since, right? But there was one thing here that's going on. They wanted to kill him, but they had a fear of the people. And the reality was a lot of the people still thought he was legit. He was the real deal, especially the pilgrims that had come out from the surrounding countrysides into Jerusalem at that time because all Jews were expected to come to Jerusalem for these festivals, right? And so one thing that the scribes and the, and the, and the chief priests didn't want to do was to somehow find a way to kill him, but it would start a riot because their, almost their greater fear was Rome would then have to come in and shut them down and do something. And they didn't want to lose their city, and so they're in this kind of quagmire. How do we kill him, but how do we do it in, in such a quiet way or a way that the people won't revolt against us so that the authorities don't crash down on us, right? So that, they've been trying to work this scenario for years. How do we do this? How do we do this? How do we do this? They probably had many solutions that they threw up on the whiteboard that they said, no, that won't work. And then finally, a solution comes to them. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the 12. So a couple significant things going on here. Um, that first part, it says, then, then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. So we, we know who the betrayer is, the ultimate um, defector, if you will. Um, but there's some ambiguity around that, about that saying. Entered into, Satan entered into Judas. Um, it is a bit ambiguous. The, the word enter into really literally means to go in. Um, so again, the commentators go from everything from maybe Judas was um, possessed by the devil, and we know that there is such thing as de demonic possession, or down to the level of influence, right? So that's the spectrum that the commentators are talking about here. Again, it's ambiguous as to what that means. The reality is that whatever it took, it, it, Satan was able to infiltrate Judas, so that he would, he would play out the role that the devil wanted him to do, right? So that calls into a couple of things that I want to touch on here real quick. Um, one is, um, you know, I don't know what you think about Satan or, or some of the things that we ascribe to Satan, um, but first and foremost, he's not all-powerful, right? We may have this assumption or fear he is powerful, but he's not all powerful, right? So even he needed some people to corroborate with him to try and get his plan to happen, right? He's not all knowing, right? Sometimes I don't know if, you, if we attribute too much to him. Now, certainly he sees things we don't see and he has probably a level of knowledge we don't, but only God is all knowing, right? So he might be even grasping at straws here thinking, how do I derail? He's like, I know this is significant. He knows it's Jesus. He knows all these things. I think in some ways, he's still grasping at straws. How do I derail the hand of God? Which is what he's been trying to do ever since the garden. Um, so just a couple of things there. But the reality is, in this statement, um, Judas became um, the pawn, if you will, reluctantly or um, agreeingly. Um, it's significant, too, that he was one of the 12, right? So he would know the, the most about Jesus' travels, he would know the most of where Jesus is. He would know the most of where the plans were. I mean, unless James, Peter, and, and John knew more, right? But he was one of the 12. He wasn't one of the other, other disciples that were there. He was, he was one of the 12. And so one of Jesus' cabinet members is deciding it's time for a revolution. 
And that's what Luke is, is letting us know here, that certain, certainly that there's influence of Satan um, that's going on through Judas, um, and it's one of the 12, right, which is the enormity of kind of the, the betrayal and the defection and the conspiracy that's going on. And the reality is this isn't the first time that Satan has, you know, shown up, if you will, to try and intervene in, in this historical um, endeavor of redemption, right? If we go back to um, Jesus right after he was baptized and was led into the desert for 40 days and fasted and spent time in prayer, he, we know that he was tempted by Satan himself, right? And then at the end of that, when, when the devil had tried everything he could with temptation, he departed from him, Jesus, until an opportune time. Right, so this, the, Fer, the Pharisees have been looking for a time and a way to kill Jesus. Satan has been looking for an opportune time to try and derail the hand of God. And so ever since he left him in, in, the, in the wilderness, he's been watching too, and, and he shows up as well. So we have three kind of co-conspirators coming together here, if you will. You have Satan, you have Judas, and you have the religious leaders, the elite of, of Israel, conspiring together to try and kill Jesus. And so we see that from Luke 4.13. We looked at that, what, I think about 10 years ago, right? We're in Luke chapter 4. Uh, Matthew 16, 21 through 23. Um, again, Satan is, he's persistent. That's one thing I, I will give him. He's persistent in trying to do evil, right? So, um, and he, he really only has so many tricks, but he just is clever in the way that he redresses them and throws them back out there. And sometimes we bite on these things, right? So in Matthew, we see this from, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Right? So Peter just didn't understand the significance of, of, of Jesus' upcoming death. And it was determined that he must go to Jerusalem and face these things. And here comes one of, one of the three. They say, no, Lord, we'll, we'll do everything we can to stop that from happening. And she's like, you don't, you don't understand. And then he has this next statement. He says, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Right? So at some point, Satan tried to whisper in Peter's ear, hey, derail him. Like, keep him from Jerusalem. Like, long live G Jesus. You know, just keep him from his plan. So in one way, he's trying to keep him from that. And the other one, he's trying to finally kill him. But he's, he's trying to keep Jesus from showing up at the right time to, uh, to live out the mission he was called to do. And here, Jesus prays for, for Peter and, and rebukes Satan at the same time. So again, Satan's been there um, trying to work through this. And then as we'll see next week, um, as Jeff will cover this, but um, again, um, uh, Satan trying to infiltrate um, Simon Peter again says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Right? So here's, here is Satan, the great accuser, is just still trying to um, to break unity. He's still trying to use some of the insiders to derail the plan of God through Jesus. And, and that's what's taking place. We'll see, like I said, we'll see that in, in two weeks. But he, Judas, went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him, Jesus, to them. Right? And so we see, um, we see him coming in. You know, he's coming in. He's just like, hey, he goes, I know the travel schedule of the Messiah. Like, I can help you get this done. Motivation, um, we don't specifically know. We don't know if it was monetarily driven, of which he was given money for. We don't know if it was politically driven, because maybe he was finally seeing that, hey, this is kingdom thing that he's preaching isn't the kingdom that we're expecting. But certainly, it had a spiritual influence. And so for whatever the reason, if it was one of those three, two of those three, all of those three, something that we're just not aware of, Judas had seen what he needed. He had been influenced enough by the whispers of Satan in his ear or whatever level that was at, and he went to the ultimate authorities and said, hey, I'm in. Let's get this done. 
and they were glad. And they agreed to give him money, right? Two statements. They, they were glad. They, like I said, they had been looking for a way, and now they knew this guy. Now we have an insider coming to us, conspiring with us. We, we don't have to fear the people. We can get this done. After three years of frustration, now the plan can move forward because we can get this done now. And then again, they agreed to give him money. It turns out it was 30 silver coins that Matthew would, would, would detail in his gospel. And so one of Jesus' 12 conspiring said, yeah, we can get this done. And so he consented and sought an opportunity to betray Jesus to them in the absence of a crowd. And I think the significant going on here, because then we'll see, we're going to see something as we look through Luke in a couple weeks, but there's going to be two levels of, um, of people betraying Jesus, I guess. At one level, we're going to see Peter deny, deny Jesus in about a day and a half from now. Three times after saying, I'll never deny you, I'll never deny you. But what we're seeing here is 100% defection of just rejecting Jesus and saying, no, I'm not only going to deny you, I defect and I'm in with the enemy and we are against you. And it's one thing to let our heart get to a point of denial. It's another thing that in our heart that we defect, we reject and we leave Jesus. You see, a believer may deny Jesus as Peter would do, but a believer would never engage in full-scale defection that Judas does. And a lack of nerve that we'll see from Peter does not equal a conscious decision of the heart to betray and reject Jesus, right? So there may be times in our lives where maybe social pressure, peer pressure, our flesh just over, you know, overtakes us, and maybe we deny Jesus, or we don't speak up when we should, or we kind of slough it off, or find a way to change a subject when we should be forthright in our speech. That's a whole other thing from full-scale just rejection. And that's what's taking place here. For whatever reason, Judas is just to a point where like, no, you are not the man. In fact, now I'm, I'm, en I'm your enemy, right? That's not reconciled. That's not turning an enemy to a friend. That's a supposed friend saying, no, I've, I've cast my vote. I've walked long enough. I'm not believing to the end. In fact, I don't believe. And I'm going to help take you out. That's what Judas is saying. And so then he'll rejoin them and look for the opportune time. So those are the first six verses of, um, of, the, of the scripture today. And the reality is there's a lot of drama going on here. There's a, there's a lot of chaos in the background. Now it's in the forefront because we see that from what Peter's saying. And now we're going to radically switch gears to, to see that Jesus truly is sovereign and in charge, God in the flesh. Because in the midst of all this chaos of life swirling around him politically in in, in you know, just surrounding him, he's going to move into a quiet time where he still is in charge. The enemy is not in charge. His co-conspirators are not in charge. Jesus, being God in the flesh, remains sovereign and is in charge. And so Luke says that then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. It became the day where these two festivals kind of go hand in hand. One would be the, the day and the timing when they would kill the sacrificial lamb that would have been part of the Passover and then ushering in the next eight days of the week of the uh, Festival of Unleavened Bread where they would go through the house, either literally or like today, or maybe it was just symbolically, to remove all the leaven or yeast, which, which really just connected to last year's harvest which is really a putting away of your lack of faith that you would just let go of that knowing that God would provide everything you need for this new season. And so that's what's taking place on this day. 
very significant day that they would celebrate again because it meant so much to them historically and also collectively looking forward that God would still be the one who redeems and would still be the one that, that <laughs> provides for the exodus. And so this is the day that this is taking place. And so this day had, this day had come. And again, the irony and the hypocrisy of, of celebrating the Passover and exodus by the leaders in the same breath, plotting Jesus' death. The most significant set of festivals, I believe, for them religiously, and yet in their heart of hearts, the people who should have been leading these festivals were in the back room conspiring to kill God in the flesh. And so I think Luke is just reminding us of the irony of what's taking place. The way the battle is coming to a crux. And so Jesus sent Peter and John into Jerusalem saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it, right? So again, God's sovereignty and Jesus' faithfulness is on display now. They're still celebrating as prescribed by the law, right? Jesus is still showing in obedience that he is still worshiping God and showing them what does it mean to worship God in the midst of chaos and uncertainty in life? Because that might be the time we decide to maybe pull back and to, and to cash things in or to cancel our plans, right? And the question is, how faithful are we and obedient in trusting God's sovereignty when our lives are troubled? I don't know for you, sometimes it's funny, I've heard both, that when, when times are the toughest, it seems like either we draw closer to God or we step the furthest away from God. And it's almost as ironic as when things are going just as good, we celebrate God and see his hand at work, or we understand or we think maybe it's from our own hand and we forget to celebrate God. But here comes ultimate chaos and, and tumult in his life, and he is just still calmly, faithfully, obediently worshiping and setting the standard for worship. And they said to him, where will you have us prepare it? Right? They weren't from Jerusalem. They didn't know the town. They didn't have, um, these two didn't have prearrangements. They weren't aware of what Jesus had arranged. And so they're asking, well, go set it up. Just tell us where, right? Our Google map isn't working. We can't Yelp it. We can't, you know, around us app. Like, where do we go? But we're ready. Just tell us where. And Jesus, and, and, and so they're asking this question, right? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Right? So somewhere along the lines, either in his provision of God, he just set it up and it's going to happen, or he had, as most commentaries um, think, and I would agree, I think so sometime during the week, of all the time he's been in Jerusalem, I think he set it up on the side, just between him and this homeowner and these people, that he would go and celebrate Passover at the right time there, that nobody would know. That he would be able to have um, a quiet time with his disciples without people knowing, that it didn't get out, um, that, it, you know, that he would be able to celebrate in this quiet time alone with them and not have to worry or know that the enemy was going to come and arrest him here because he had some significant things to talk to his brothers about. That again, in the midst of the chaos that's going on, Jesus is calm, cool, collected, and in charge. And as I thought about that, um, like I said, right, we all go through difficult times of life. And it seems maybe like one thing or two things might significantly be going, going bad. And, you know, and where do we stand in our faith at those times? I think back over the last four or five years um, to where uh, my family's been. Um, it's been chaos and it's been significant uh, almost without relent for about five years uh, without getting into any specifics. I mean, extreme difficulty and chaos um, in our nuclear family, in our immediate extended family with parents and things going on and lawsuits and attempted this and that and a layoff of me, that there's been utter 
utter chaos, uh, major uncertainty, where it would have been easy, and it would be easy for me to say, forget it. Just, I'm done. Cash in my chips, whatever that means, or I'm going to shut up, I'll talk about Jesus, I'm gonna go into the background, take a hiatus, whatever it is. This, the uncertainty of these last four or five years has just been brutal. But in the midst of that, God has been sovereign, has provided for my family, is protecting us, um, is significant, and, and it requires us to maintain that same level of faith, the same level of faith we need to have to celebrate God when things seem to be good, God calls us to have that same level of faith to trust in him when chaos is just so loud. And that's what's going on with Jesus right now. He knows, right? He's the one that knows all things. He, he knows the conspiracy that's taking place. He's already set aside a quiet time with everything that's needed to celebrate, to celebrate what the law required to show them faithfulness in the midst of uncertainty. Jesus isn't freaking out. And he knows what's about to take place in the next 24 hours. He knows it absolutely. He says, you know what? Yeah, I went on Travelocity. I booked us a room. I didn't tell you. It's all fine. Meals on wheels will show up. It's all good. I got it covered. Here's what you need to do, right? So now he's given him the plan. He says, behold, when you've entered the city, so go in, there'll be a man carrying a jar of water, and he'll meet you. Significant, significant because men don't typically carry jars of water. That was a kind of a task that the women would do. If they did, they had skins of water or skins of juice that they would carry, and so that would be one thing right away. When you get in, you can't miss it. There's going to be a guy carrying a water, a jar of water. But that's a girl's thing. That's why you can't miss it, right? In our society, that's how you'll know this is the guy and ask him and follow him. All right. So follow him to the house that he enters. And tell the master of that house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepared there. And, and I would have to guess the most difficult week of Jesus' life, he left nothing to chance. He took care of every small detail. He had all of the things required for this intricate meal that they would have all set and take, taken place. He had a room booked and he had a connection with the person that somehow, you know, it didn't get out. So you'll find my friend, go and follow these prescribed things, and he'll take you right there, and I have it all set. We're going to have a meal together. It would turn out it would be his final meal, where we'll see next week he's going to institute some significant things. And we'll see over the next several weeks of what he's teaching his disciples both in word and in action. And I, and I wonder if the disciples would then look back and just realize how chaotic this week of life really was and think, wow, wasn't he amazing that he even took care of the, the greatest meal of the year when he knew what was taking place? Imagine if it was Thanksgiving week for you, and Thanksgiving is that meal. But maybe that week, you know, maybe mom was battling cancer in the hospital. The spouse left town. The kids are sick. Whatever the most utter chaos could be that would kind of sink your battleship. And how easy would it be for you to say, yeah, you know, Thanksgiving, <sighs> what I have to be grateful about. I'll put it on hold for next year, and we'll see if things are good next year that I'll give thanks. But Jesus is thinking, no, after the meal tonight, I'm going to go pray. I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to have 
charges trumped up against me, falsely accused, hung on a cross, beaten, scourged, whipped, killed, utterly rejected. But before that, we're going to have thanksgiving, even though I know this is coming down the pike. He's not finding a way to bolt the doors in. He's not loading up ammunition with, with arrows and whatnot. He's actually arming his disciples with the greatest tools that they could ever have, spiritual tools, a reminder that God is in control, that God is sovereign, and he has a plan, and he's going to let them in on things. No, this is what the exodus of the world is going to look like, not just Israel, right? I, he says that he came to give his life as a ransom for all. The things that Israel failed to do as a light to the nations, he's the ultimate light. And so he's reminding them this week, this meal that we'll look at in the next couple weeks. He said, it's go time. It's not hunker down time and go hide in a bunker. It's go time. Get your go bags, get ready, because the battle is here. And everything he came to do in his life is about to be fulfilled. He says, you, you should understand Passover. You should understand Exodus such that it is, but I'm going to do it such that you had no idea. But first and foremost, we're going to celebrate because it's Thanksgiving. We call it Passover and unleavened bread. But it's recalling the faithfulness of God and it's anticipating the sovereign faithfulness of God in that moment and for the future. And surprise. They went and found it just as he had told them and they prepared for the Passover. You see, what Jesus said would happen, happened. What they should be reminded about, that everything he had ever said had happened. The words that we had looked at the last couple of weeks of God judging the nation in the words of God was God's faithfulness about what he said in the past. Nothing that God said in the past hadn't come to fruition or isn't coming to fruition. And so if we ever wonder, was God legit in the person of Jesus, we have to look back at the faithfulness of every word spoken that came true and realize those things not true yet just haven't happened, but they will. But in the midst of chaos, Jesus provides what we need. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this reminder and Lord, I don't know where each person here is coming from. I don't know um, what's swirling around in the, uh, the chaos of their life, or maybe just it's a calm peace that just is like quiet waters. And you're faithful in the turbulent, and you're faithful in the tranquil. And you are true. You are true to your character and your integrity is 100% and it's trustworthy. And God, I pray that we are a people who bank on your promises. And then in light of that, we live out the things you've called us to do. To build inroads into the lives of those around us. To love you wholeheartedly. To love each other as a community. And God, I pray that we would be reminded to put your words into practice day in and day out, but celebrate. God, I pray that even in the midst of chaos, we don't lose the eyesight to see you and your sovereignty and to thank you. And God, I pray that you would touch our hearts as we worship you, as we take communion, and as next week we'll, we'll break down what these elements mean through the teaching of your word. But we have this moment to worship you, to thank you, Maybe just to realign with you. God, speak to us through this time of worship that our hearts would resonate with yours. And I thank you for the gift of this moment in Jesus' name. Amen.